What's up guys, we're back with an educational video and this week we're talking about the top five protein myths. But first, make sure you like the video, subscribe to the channel, and leave a comment for algorithm. So protein is by far the most popular macronutrient to talk about in the fitness industry, other than maybe carbohydrates, but that's only in the crazy, zealot, low carb community. For most normal people, they like to talk about protein. And as such, there are a lot of protein myths out there. So let's get to the top five. Number one, you can only absorb X amount of protein at a meal. Usually this number is somewhere around 25 to 30 grams, which is what people say you can absorb at a meal from protein. This is a case where we need to be very specific with our definitions. So absorption refers to the digestion and breakdown of food material into individual molecules and then the absorption of those molecules into circulation. In the case of protein, it breaks down into amino acids and those amino acids are absorbed through the intestinal lumen into the portal vein of the liver and into the liver and then to circulation. Now in the case of fats, they go through the lymphatic system so it's slightly different. But basically, once something comes out of the intestine, it has now been absorbed. You can absorb however much protein you eat. If you didn't, if you just had pieces of undigested food or undigested material in your GI tract, you would have diarrhea because your body is not going to allow undigested material to just sit there. You draw water into your intestine and you would crap it out. If this were true that you could only absorb, you know, 30 grams of protein in a meal, every time you had an eight ounce steak, you'd just be having massive diarrhea a few hours later. That's not what happens. Now, I think where the disconnect is, many people say the word absorb, but what they actually mean is what amount of protein at a meal is useful for muscle building? What amount of protein at a meal maximizes the anabolic response? Just because something's absorbed doesn't mean that every single gram of that will go towards anabolism. So when we look at the data on muscle protein synthesis, it looks like anywhere from 20 to 40 grams of protein for most people, depending on the source of protein, will maximize muscle protein synthesis. Now, if you're eating a very high quality source of protein like whey protein, it is going to be towards the lower end of that spectrum. If you're eating a very low quality source of protein like an intact plant protein that maybe has a low leucine amount, like say wheat or something of that nature, then you're gonna need more of that protein because one, it's less digestible, and two, it also has a lower essential amino acid content. Number two, high protein diets are bad for the kidneys. This stems from a lot of old dogma in nephrology, which is basically goes something like this. Protein is made of chains of amino acids. When you break down the protein, it turns into amino acids, and the amine portion of the amino acid is an ammonia group. Now, as a part of an amino acid, it is not toxic. But when it is removed, you cannot just have free ammonia floating around your bloodstream. That would be toxic. So your body turns it into something called urea. And that urea is excreted in your urine. It's safe. It's non-toxic. But the kidney has to process that. And so for people who have kidney failure, it has often been advised for them to follow low protein diets. Now, we have a plethora of data out there, including a meta-analysis by Stu Phillips that very clearly demonstrated that protein does not harm a healthy kidney. It just doesn't. There's no evidence to support that, and we actually have evidence to the contrary. Furthermore, even for people with renal disease, it appears that up to possibly stage three of renal disease, that a low protein diet, while it lessens the load on the kidney, it also impairs the ability of that tissue to recover. And so you're weighing recovery and repair versus the load on the kidney. And it is not clear at this point as to whether or not a low protein diet actually helps with that based on the literature I've seen. Now, if you're somebody who has kidney issues, again, I would always recommend 
that you talk to a nephrologist and someone who's an expert in the field. But based on the most current literature, it's not cut and dry that a low protein diet actually helps with people with renal disease. Now, if you get past stage three, in that case, you're just dealing with a person who needs to lower their overall solute load. Indeed, high glucose, high sodium, these things can also be a solute load on the kidney and can also cause problems. So it's probably less about the actual protein and more about just the total solute load on the kidney. Number three, high protein diets are bad for the liver. For anybody who's ever followed a high protein diet, many times if you go get your blood work done, you'll see that your liver enzymes might be elevated. This has led people to say that high protein diets damage the liver. Once again, there's no evidence of this actually being true for a healthy liver and for long-term high protein diets. In fact, we have data even for people eating up to three grams per kilogram of body weight protein that it doesn't appear to have negative effects in a randomized control trial that lasted a year. So we just don't see those effects. When people say, well, elevate your liver enzymes, listen, if you have liver damage or liver disease, your liver enzymes will be elevated. But just because your liver enzymes are elevated does not mean you have liver disease or liver damage. So these are two things that are correlated, but not always causative. Now, once again, this directionality flows one way. If you have liver disease or damage, you will have elevated levels of liver enzymes. But just because you have elevated levels of liver enzymes does not mean you have liver disease or damage. Number four, high protein diets will give you cancer. So this stems from literature showing that in the short term, high protein feedings increase mTOR activation and also increase IGF-1. mTOR is a complex that was found through the drug rapamycin and rapamycin inhibits this complex and is used in the treatment of many cancers. So people have taken this and said, well see, if we're using rapamycin to treat cancer, protein must cause cancer. That's not with how that works. And additionally, we use chemotherapy to treat cancer, but you would not give chemotherapy to a healthy person. <laughs> That's not how that works. Additionally, these short-term elevations in the signaling of mTOR or a hormone like IGF-1 are not necessarily predictive of long-term outcomes. Great example of this is let's just look at resistance training. If you resistance train, you actually get a much greater response of mTOR and IGF-1 compared to eating a high protein meal. So by that logic, does resistance training give you cancer? No, in fact, we see that in people who resistance train, they actually have a lower risk of developing cancer. So obviously cancer development is much, much more complicated than just you eat protein, it stimulates mTOR and IGF-1, and you get cancer. That's not how it works. And most of the longitudinal studies on this are pretty mixed with their results. It is not a consistent finding in any way, shape, or form. And if you want to look at short-term signaling as predictors of health outcomes, then let's not talk about how carbohydrates raise insulin, which is going to give you insulin resistance. Let's not talk about how fat reduces flow-mediated dilation, which is a predictor for heart disease. So what are you left to eat if you can't eat any of the three macronutrients? Again, these diseases are multifactorial and have many different causes. And just pointing at protein and saying, ah, see, it's protein, it's not really supported by the literature. Number five, you can't build muscle on a vegan diet. I was probably much more anti-vegan protein 20 years ago when I first got into researching this stuff than I am now. I think it's very hard to support the position that you cannot build muscle on a vegan diet. In fact, we know it's not true because we see quite a few people who are vegans who build significant amounts of muscle being on a vegan diet. Is it as good as a diet that also includes animal protein? Well, it can be if you have enough planning because plant proteins tend to have lower quality protein in terms of their essential amino acid content. And if you're talking about taking in the intact plant protein, so when I say intact, I mean like if we're talking about soy protein versus soybean, intact would be the soybean, whereas like soy protein powder is an isolated form of that protein. Intact plant sources of protein tend to have much less bioavailability 
than isolated sources of protein. So if you're trying to get enough protein to build muscle as a vegan just from intact sources of plant protein, you're gonna run into the problem of trying to get one, enough from those sources, and two, the fact that it's lower bioavailability, and three, the fact that it also is gonna have some carbohydrate and fat attached to that protein, which is gonna make it harder, especially if you're somebody in a caloric deficit trying to get enough of that protein in while also trying to limit your calories. But you can certainly supplement with isolated forms of plant protein like soy or potato protein. Corn protein also has very high leucine, although it's low in lysine. But you can also include pea protein as an adjunct to the corn protein. And now you have something that does have enough lysine. It also has quite a bit of leucine and essential amino acid content. And so doing those different forms of protein, you can actually get enough high quality protein to build just as much muscle as you would if you were eating animal protein. Now, I'm not saying you have to do that. I'm not saying you should do that. I'm just saying it is possible with the appropriate amount of planning. All right, guys, if you like this video, make sure you like the video. If you're looking for a high quality source of protein, my supplement company, Outwork Nutrition, sells a whey protein isolate, which in my opinion is probably the highest quality form of protein on the market right now. It tastes great, very low carb, very low fat, and it's priced competitively. It will not turn you into a monster overnight, like some people would like to make it seem like their protein supplements do, but it is a very high quality form of protein that's at a competitive price and tastes great. So if you're interested in that, click the links to Outwork in the description, and I'll catch you guys next week.